What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Eastern Current. Got uh, Cameron here with me. I've got Michael. Let's see if I can pull him up real quick. Where is he? Right there. My camera's dead, so we're on the laptop. Oh, bro. bro that's not his name. Hold on. I started going before we're, we're fully fully ready to, to rock and roll. Let me see if I can pull him back up on this. Here we go. Boom. I need to unlock this scene. Pull you in like this. This is for everybody that's watching, watching my uh, watching my screw ups here. Um, but we're gonna just we were trying to come up with a topic for today, and we decided we're just gonna kind of see where it goes. We're gonna. <laughs> I think now Mike's on every scene. No, there we go. <laughs> we're gonna see uh, just kind of where the topic takes us. We're dealing with some really cold temperatures here in North Carolina right now, as well as up and on the East Coast. So that's definitely gonna be part of our topic. But we're just going to kind of ramble and chit chat about what's been going on this winter um, and how things have been um, playing out so far this year. So we'll we'll just kind of get going. But before we get going, Mike, you've got some some boat issues going on right now. What have you figured out what the what the issue is? I have not. It is the same electrical issue that I had. I don't know three or four months ago. So I'm going to start the starter for some reason is just not wanting to turn over the motor completely. But I've already replaced the starter, so hopefully find out something in the next few weeks. But yeah, that's uh, that's freaking boats right there. Yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know what the deal is, but it's all good. We'll get her taken care of. Be ready for rock and roll here in a few weeks. Hopefully, be ready for some springtime and warm up fishing. Yeah, I was I was talking to Mike earlier. Me and Cameron. I've got more than one boat. Cameron's about to have more than one boat. And I was like, Mike, you ready to get another boat? And he's like, absolutely not. I just want one boat. Too many issues. I, I, what's uh, what's the latest on your bay boat? Oh, I got a call um, a couple of days ago. It's supposed to be ready in uh, about three to four weeks. Nice. Thank you. Supposedly. She said, don't get your hips up too much just because um, I think the motor uh, coming in is fairly certain, but not 100% certain. Yeah. Um, but... I already got my hopes up, so if they don't get it, you're gonna flip out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and tell everyone again. I think we've talked about it here before, but what what bay boat did you end up going with? Because you're running the mosquito, the beaver tail. Yep. Mosquito. Um, that thing stings. And then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dad joke. Uh, yeah. So that's the the boat I've been running for uh, about five years now. Um, but I think like, kind of like what we talked about before, just. I love inshore fishing. I love um, sight fishing for redfish, but at the same time, um, I really want to get better at other types of fishing too. For sure. And it just keeps it interesting for me. So being able to go out there and kind of do what I did growing up, trolling for Spanish, um, it, false albacore is also a big one for me just because I like to get after them and fly so much. Yeah. Um, and then on really nice days, maybe being able to go out there and do some grouper fishing, which I really don't know, like that, that'll be the probably biggest learning curve for me is right. trying to find spots to catch grouper, but, um, it'll be fun. That that's kind of what for me keeps it fresh for is sure. learning new things. I think you're going to love that near shore, having the ability to near shore bottom fish a bunch mm-hmm. too, not even grouper, but like tog and sheep's head and redfish and black drone and stuff right off the beach. That's just a, that's one thing that I've started tapping into more the past maybe three years because mm-hmm. um, it's tough man it's it's even if it's good all the time it's tough to go and do the shallow water sight fishing for redfish every day like it's just not that it's tough it's just it's it's nice to have the ability to mix it up and do some other stuff yeah, as well I think mixing it up is uh, is a big thing for me and I mean the, the the schools of redfish in the winter and the spring get a lot of pressure yeah and uh, being, able to, being able to let off them a little bit and go do something sure. else is is always a good option in my opinion um so that, i think there's various reasons why i wanted another boat um but i, I think in one of them also being family because yeah. um i have a baby now and my wife uh isn't a huge fan of going on an 18 foot skiff that yeah. uh sits about this far above the water um so that that's one of the main reasons as well for sure, it's nice to have have the bay boat. And Mike's got kind of like a he's got a flat skiff, but like an in between flat skiff where you can li- do a little bit of both. You can mm-hmm. you can kind of cross over a little bit better. But what's the uh, is there an ETA on like the diagnostic on your boat, or if they're going to figure out, or when they're going to have it fixed, or whatnot? Um, 
Um, three to four weeks That's is nice. what the guy said. Um, depending on as long as there's not an issue with the power head, then that it might be six suck. to seven, but. I don't think that's going to be the issue because it will turn over. It's just very, very slow. So I think there's some kind of electrical sensor or ground or something that's just funky in the motor. So Yeah, for sure. But, I've got anyways. this time of year is always such a annoying time of year because I'm paying to fix all the stuff in my boat that I let build up over the summer. Because, uh, you know, if something breaks over the summer and it's not a necessity, you just kind of ride it out till, mm-hmm. till the winter. So Yeah. And – well. That was kind of where I was at, like, this past fall coming into the, you know, the last home stretch of the last year was so many things had gone down that, you know, I kind of put off and then kind of everything I think hit at once. Three new batteries, blah, 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 you know, new fuse block and then other electrical issues on top of that. Just kind of, I think, all compounded right there at the end of the year for me. Yeah, break out another thousand <laughs> over and over again. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's rarely one thing. That you have to fix. No, I've learned that it comes in like waves of three, like three <laughs> yeah. things at a time on each yeah. boat. Yeah, you bring it in thinking one thing's broken and then they're like, um, well, you should probably replace this and this too because those all are connected. And you're right. Like, okay. Yeah, that's always, uh, that's always tough. Um, I've got to fix my jack plate on my Pathfinder. Need to, my well, my trim tabs and... It must be, it's something electrical. I don't know. I don't know much about it, but it might be in the fuse block or it might be some type of connection or ground. But my, every once in a while, my, all my live wells and my trim tabs will go out at the same time and then they'll start working again. And they'll go out together again. And I'm dealing with that right now. So I want to get that fixed. Got to get my jack plate fixed. This past summer, it would just, there was one day I was fishing and all of a sudden it just started going up on its own. Like it would just keep going up on its own. And luckily I had like three mechanics on the boat. That that were from uh, from Orton, their mechanics at Orton Plantation, and uh, I had them on the boat, and they were able to like very quickly jump in there, get my jack plate back down, and then we just popped the fuse out so it wouldn't go back up. <laughs> but I would have been screwed because that that is a short shaft motor on that Pathfinder, and if it, the jack plate goes all the way up, I would have had to literally idle from where I was all the way back to the ramp, which was pretty quite, far. quite a run. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, that that was that was nice, but hopefully it'll we'll get it all fixed up. I had like some uh, looseness of my console, not in the floor or anything, nothing structural, but just like um, it, where the toe kick comes together on the console. Just got that fixed by Peter Scholes um, at at Bonafide Craft Shop, I think is what it's called. Uh, he does incredible work, and uh, yeah, just kind of getting things ready for the spring. What are some of the other Things I think that's kind of something good we can get into a little bit is like so, some of the things you y'all like to try to do in the winter to prepare for the next fishing season. Not that we're not still fishing hard right now, but you know the full swing summer fishing season where we're with clients every day. What what are some some good or, or even stuff for people that you know are just recreationally fishing? What are some good tips and tricks that that y'all have kind of come up with to you know be ready for the upcoming season? Hmm tips and tricks i think for me it's just organization again like i know the other day before i took my boat in and dropped it off just in the last you know two three months i've accrued buckets of either trash lures that i've just cut off and thrown in there deal with it later cup holders that are full of stuff like just clean the boat out get everything organized back in the tackle boxes you know changing out hooks on top waters mirror lures whatever it is from fishing uh for trout this fall um, and then really like once it gets down to winter time like this, good, especially going into February, I love to sit at home and tie on the vice. So you've been tying a bunch? Uh, every night, yeah. Filling up a little box over here. So for those of y'all that like fly tying or think you might, there you go. Thank you. Yeah. Nice. Or think you might like fly tying. I think I texted y'all about this the other day, but um, Luke Worley at uh, Good Grace's Tattoo Shop. He's a really good fly angler. Um, has been a good buddy of mine for years. He's starting a, uh, a fly tying night every... The first one's going to be the 27th of this month. Uh, but he'll have beer there and everything and like a, an assortment of materials. Any specific materials you want, bring yourself. Obviously, I would say just bring all your materials that you want to tie with that night so you're not busting into his stash if you don't have to. Um, but it'll be every... Whatever that day is... 
it was 27th yeah, maybe what is the 27th mm, 27th is next thursday so uh, yeah every thursday indefinitely we'll be having a fly tying night at luke's shop good graces tattoos and i think let me pull it up i can't remember the time so now that i'm into it i need to just go ahead and, and tell everybody um Let's see here. Um, but we've been talking about that for years, about doing a fly tying night. Um, and I'm glad he's finally doing it. Where is it? Is he going to teach people, like, patterns, or is it just come hang out? I think it's come hang out tie. and tie, yeah. I mean, people can – fly tying nights I've seen – I've never been to an actual fly tying night, but it seems like, you know, sometimes they'll have, like, a tying competition, like, you know, some random materials, like a zip tie and some golden retriever hair and, like <laughs> – See who can come up with the best fly. With I think we'll do lots of fun stuff like that, but more so just to hang out, just to get to know each other. You know, the community of of light tackle and fly fishing anglers has definitely grown like crazy in our area, mm-hmm. um, and I think we could have a lot of power for conservation um, if we if we group up together. You know, there's lots of little fly fishing gangs or cliques out there. I feel like, but <laughs> yes. but if we can all work together, it could be a, a, a pretty cool thing. But e- even if y'all don't want to work together, come out and tie some flies. And, and hang out and drink some, some beers together. But I cannot find his freaking text message. Maybe get a tattoo while you're there, too. I'll, yeah, I'll definitely get a tattoo. <laughs> um, uh, all right, I can't find it. I cannot find it. Uh, any specific things that you've decided to do this year, Mike, as far as organization goes? Like anything new that you're going to try to do with, with your gear? Um, yeah, actually, um, let's see here. So biggest thing is probably a switchover of style of tackle boxes for me. Um, I'm switching over to I don't know six to eight. Them. It's gonna be six to eight every Thursday night. Six o'clock to eight o'clock. Got it. Oh yeah, I've seen those. But yeah, the new the new Plano Edge I think is what they're considered boxes. Um, I know a lot of my top waters, a lot of my mirror lures, that kind of stuff, just get a lot of hook rash from sitting in the boat in those boxes day after day after day after day, beating around, banging around in the bottom of the boat. So switching over to that and then also taking advantage of the little guys, like all these new little boxes that have come out that are waterproof. Um, you know, I think that's something new that's kind of coming onto the market in the last five years. I mean, we've had waterproof tackle boxes, but they're big ones, you know. And, yeah, it's great. It holds a lot of stuff. But then you get mixed between jig heads. And I, at least for me, like, I have two of them. One specifically for the fall time for slip float flushing for, with shrimp and mud minnows. And another one that's just for Carolina rigs. So weights, swivels, specific circle hooks, whatever the case may be. Um, but I don't have to open up a big box. It's small enough. I can leave it laying there on the bottom of the boat, grab it when I need it without having to get in and out of hatches a ton. Um, and especially like when you're sight fishing going into the winter time, I feel like that's kind of stuff I can just pull out, throw it to the side. I can keep some of my big boxes in there, but really just breaking down my tackle kind of specifically. Um, I have a bunch of big hatches in the back of my boat and up on the front, so I have kind of that room to organize a lot more than maybe some people do, but um, taking advantage of that space and trying to use it wisely so I know exactly what I want. I can go, I can grab it and be quick on the water about getting people back on fishing or whatever. For sure. One thing that, that I thought was cool that I have not tried that Cameron was doing is like he has specific boxes, and I think that's smart. Like. I'm always trying to figure out what's going to be the best, and I don't think there's like a best for one person, like that something that's best for everybody. But um, you know, you kind of find your individual things that that work. Um, and so, Cameron does like a redfish box, and he'll have a few different things for redfish in that box, or like everything that he needs for redfish in that box, and then a trout box, and a flounder box, and albacore box. Like, I I think that's. Because I, I just roll with so much stuff in my boat that it, it's awesome for about a week while it's organized and then it starts to get so unorganized. Like, I think trying to find how you can carry the least amount of stuff but still be ready to rock and roll, still be organized and, and good to go when um, your trips roll around and when you're out on the water. So have you has that been a beneficial 
for you just running the species specific boxes? Have you ever found yourself out there like you're just planning on red fishing and you don't have all your trout stuff or how, how does that work? No, I mean, pretty much any time um, I go inshore fishing, I'll bring my red fish in my uh, trout box. Yeah. And then if I'm bringing fly rods, I'll bring my fly boxes too. Um, and then if I'm <laughs> if I'm doing all three, uh, or all, uh, yeah, all three, so red fishing, trout, fly fishing for red fish, and then if, for whatever reason, this doesn't happen very often, but if I was going to live bait fish too, I have a, a box that just has all the terminal tackle in there that i would need um for stuff like that but um for me i think it it happened just because uh my boat does not have a lot of storage i really just have the two um seats that so i sit on and whoever's next to me sits on underneath those seats is essentially two storage compartments and there's just not a ton of room and so being able to scale down and just take what you need is pretty important for me to like stay uh, effective, and um, but but I like it. I think I'm going to carry that over to to a bay boat too. But depending on how much storage is on that boat, maybe keeping like we talked about, just like boxes of terminal tackle. Yeah. On yeah. that, just so I don't have to bring them on every time. Back and forth. Yeah. Um, because it does get like, it just gets time consuming with. Like, I take everything off my boat every time I use it. Um, one, just because my boat sits in my driveway and I don't want anybody to right, take it. Right. Um, Probably helps you keep it clean, though, too. But, it, uh, yeah, I think it helps me keep it clean uh, for the most part. I mean, I still get rust on my hooks, especially top waters for whatever reason. Um, I think because I just keep so many of them in the same thing. All right. Um, but, no, I, th- I think... Overall, it is it's helped me uh, cut down on time on like looking for something and for sure. just getting getting lures wet quicker. Yeah, for it, what uh, it's worth. Something um something that I started. I think Jad actually turned me onto this, but the little desiccant packets that you get in yeah. like you know furniture, random stuff. You can actually buy them, I guess, through Amazon. But um whatever we get something that has those in them i just have a little bucket here at the house or a little bag i keep them in and then i throw them in all my tackle boxes at least one and like terminal tackle stuff and then two or three and you know where i have lures and stuff hard baits so that to me has made the biggest difference and you know just keeping everything from rusting yeah uh I, especially I, I, like at the end of the day when i cut everything off i have one cup holder on the dash i pile all my stuff in it then when i get home i just hit it with the hose you know i know it's getting all the salt off of it that i can and let it dry throw it back in the boxes so for sure uh it that definitely helps a lot i love putting uh, those packets in there and it's funny i uh the first couple times i did it i just was taking some of those packets from stuff that i had ordered from amazon and putting it mm-hmm. in those boxes and i learned that you can actually get just order those little packets it's like those little packets of those clear beads that just wick the moisture out of the air um, and now if you get a bunch of water in your tackle box it's not going to do anything but that little moisture that might get hang- be hanging out in there a couple of drops of water on a, on a single bait like it, it'll it'll suck that out of there um yeah but uh i think that well, like what you were talking about, Mike, with your single tackle box with all your terminal tackle, I think that's that that's helped me out a lot this year. Because used to I'd have like bags of weights and then little bags of hooks, but like I was getting the small yeah. tackle boxes and filling it up with like this is my slip float box, this is my uh, or like just a float fishing box, and this is my Carolina rig box. That way, I would just keep that in the con like one of those in my skiff and then one of those in my bay boat. And that was the kind of stuff that I always kept. Like, there's certain lures that I definitely take on and off. Certain certain things I take on and off. But there's also stuff that stays on the 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 boat all the time. But the problem yeah. with that is sometimes when you leave it on the boat all the time, you you lose track of how much you have left. So mm-hmm. you'll like get out there one day. There were some days this past season where I was running like two smaller egg sinkers on a Carolina rig, as opposed to you know one correct size egg sinker <laughs> on a Carolina rig because I'd. <laughs> Lost track of how many I had had, and those that doesn't work that well. You think it would work fine, but they actually will tangle up on each other pretty easily. So yeah, um, I think too like this time of year I go through and like try to order. Like I've got some bags of jig heads, I got some bags of weights, hooks, you know, 
I kind of take this time to figure out what I want or what I fished a lot this past year and like, all right, this is the kind of stuff I need. I'll go buy it by, you know, a hundred pack or whatever through intercoastal or wherever I can get it, you know, and get a good deal on it. And that way it's kind of sitting here. I don't have to think about it whenever time comes around, you know, even when just the mullet run starts, I'm like, got my box. I've got my extras at the house. I'm good to go. You know? For sure. So. For sure. Um, I don't know. I'm, I, I really still don't feel, I think I've said this on a recent podcast. Like I, I blame it on not having found the right, like organization tactic for myself, but it really is just the fact that I'm terrible at organizing and staying organized and staying clean. So that's, uh, that's kind of something I've got to deal with myself. But, <laughs> um, unfortunately I can keep a boat clean for about a week and then it, then it kind of falls falls to the wayside but um going into this next season is there any tackle or any gear that y'all are excited about that you picked up or that you're going to be trying um that you haven't fished before as far as like terminal tackle and you know hard baits and stuff i don't think there's anything really new for me um y'all know i've talked about yozuri topwaters i love those so you know i've kind of stocked up this winter i picked up i don't know another five or ten of those just to add to my boxes um but i think for me the biggest thing that i've been doing is tying new uh ep brushes on my own so yeah that's sweet excited for that for uh you know fly fishing this summer but just little ep brushes out of fly tire dungeons um congo hair and some different things but just being able to make specific colors whatever you got laying around instead of having to go buy it yeah um save a few dollars there and just kind of burn some time at night did you make a wire turner or did you buy one of those ones that makes... yeah so actually i did make my own let's see here you're like my it's buddy kind of, adam this wire it's, kind of turner, it's like 200 bucks to buy one of those things to make the i think 200 bucks and adam and mike just make their own because they're they're like that oh yeah you made a legit one so how does that work Take, walk me through it do I know? How does that work exactly? So it's got this little table here in the center. Yeah. It's got a spring on this end. You hook your wire here and then run it down to your hook down here. Cut all your materials, lay them on it, loop the wire back to your spring. And then you just spin your, well, you pull the table out once the materials are suspended inside the wire. And you just get rid of that. And then take your handle, spin your wire, and as the wire spins, you know, it'll tighten up and pull the spring out. And I just have a little dog brush and then pick it out, clean up the wire or clean the, you know, fibers up a little bit, get them to stick out, and then keep spinning until you feel like everything's good and tight. Yeah, that's so, sick. You're gonna need, so you're gonna need to bring that to the fly tying night. You're gonna be a, <laughs> a legend. <laughs> <laughs> so. This is just one really that I started good. with. It's a little funky, but it's got That's all kinds awesome. of crazy colors in it. Yeah, I like that. Um, Louisiana colors right there. Yeah. You know, tan. I'm trying to see. I got some more, like, or that one's tan and olive. Tan with some brown legs, a little copper flash in it. So, I don't know. A lot of it's just playing around with things, figuring out what materials you've got, what you can make. But, um,. Keep little pill bottles here on the fly tying table, and like whenever I cut my craft fur, all the little under fur that you take out, um, I add that into the brush to give it some extra color. Yeah. That's what that little olive and tan one is with the green legs. But oh, yeah. that's sweet. Yeah, I've made my own a couple times, but not with something that would make it that easy. It's kind of a pain. Oh yeah, that looks good. So, um, these are a little big. These are definitely like more Louisiana style, but whenever we get some, you know, kind of dirtier water, I like a little bigger profile sometimes. Got some homemade eyes in there. Heck yeah. And the cool thing too is with that brush, like so many times I've sat on the boat and taken a fly that I'm tied with brush like that, like a brush body, and you can trim it down way smaller. Like on the yeah. boat, like if you need a smaller profile, mm -hmm. you can very quickly... Like a lot of times I think it's nice to leave those bushier to start out with and then get out there and like what you want that day, just turn that fly down a little bit and have something that cuts the water a little bit more, have something, leave some hair on it, let it land soft, let it push some more water. Um, yeah. You can, you can do that. Uh, God, Adam is like, Adam has like a bob on his boat. will always have a bobbin and thread 
and some materials and stuff like on the boat with him so he can like change flies up a little bit on the boat if they're not working that's always been that's, that's like next level stuff i'll never i'll never get to that level so um, well he's also fishing tarpon and bonefish permit like very way picky, picky fish i feel yeah. like definitely um, for but. sure um well sweet well y'all are inspiring me to tie some flies i don't think i've touched that vice in like probably a year <laughs> so it's uh i've got plenty of materials over here in the closet <laughs> yes you do um but just not haven't been tying anything so i'm gonna get to it i'm definitely gonna get to it um well cool well let's talk a little bit about fishing in, the, in this weather and crap that we've got going on right now so you know if you if someone was wanting to fish today or the next couple of days i mean i feel like a lot of people probably hang it up but i feel like it is important to know how to go fish when it is this cold because you know sometimes it might especially february early march it can be like this pretty consistently mm-hmm. and i feel like that, talking about this even i just want to open the window nope no snow i wanted to see if there's any snow outside <laughs> <laughs> they keep talking about snow but i don't think it's gonna happen um, <laughs> but what are what are some of the things that you start to think about or that we start to think about in these colder months like as far as red fishing goes Anybody want to take a crack at that at first? Moving baits slow. Slow baits. I think that's like, sometimes that's the hardest thing for me to remember. Yeah. Because if I see a redfish or a school of redfish, I want to work it like how I normally would. Right. Um, when really, I, and I'm, I know we've talked about this many times, but uh, just like working it super slow on the bottom, just giving it little twitches, almost holding it in place. Yeah. Uh, when fish are really cold, that seems to work the best, in my opinion. For sure. Yeah, I think that just being conscious of how much you actually are moving the bait. Because right. like, I feel like until I got underwater in a pool and like watched someone jig a soft plastic and mm-hmm. try to film it, like realizing how fast <laughs> it's actually moving away, like a like all right, fish that really slow so I can film it. And I mean, little like a, a five inch swing of the rod tip is going to move a bait like three feet. Like if you pop it, you know, five inches, it's going to move a bait three or four feet on the bottom. So, I mean, when we say move it slow, it's like just kind of dragging it. Like you can do a five inch movement of the rod tip that only moves at five inches. And you Mm -hmm. can also do a five inch movement of the rod tip that moves at three or four feet. So just being conscious of how much you're moving that bait and, um, and whatnot. So. Yeah. I also slow down like my reel. Yeah. Instead of doing like a full reel, full all the way around, I might do it like half. Yeah. Um, just to bring it in a little less. And then I, I feel like the most productive uh, way that I've found to fish for cold redfish is just to try and make your bait, where's the camera, or like do like <laughs> a pop, pop, pop to get it up in the air and then let it sink almost like trying to imagine it going like five inches from where it went up. Yeah. And then pop, pop, pop and letting it flutter back down and then sit where it was. For sure. Five inches further. Um, so No, I think that's awesome. And I, it's a bad time of year to do it, but I need to remind everybody that listens to this in the summer. Like, go get in a pool with your buddy and, and <laughs> throw some baits and actually look in the water at, like, how much you're moving them and how far mm-hmm. they're moving. I just think it's it's tough to to really tell how quickly you're moving a bait in. So um, it's funny. So, like, some clients, you'll tell them to fish it, you know, fish really slow. And, you know, they're fishing at a normal speed. And then other clients, you're like, fish it really slow. And not even clients, just people that haven't they fished. Don't, and they, they don't move it. They don't move it at all. And <laughs> it, but but sometimes that, like like Cam said, there's some baits like this the, this Ned rig that I'm playing with in my hand right here that you can get away with like really not doing anything, especially if you've got a little bit of current. Yeah. Just getting it in front of those fish and letting them pick it up, especially if you've got some scent in it. Scent is another thing that can be so important oh, this yeah. time of year too. Definitely. Um, I don't really mess with scent at all in the summer, but in the wintertime I do. I'll put it on baits. Yeah. So what about you, Mike? I was gonna say a lot of um, like you know natural colors, kind of playing with the color patterns that you're throwing this time of year can make a big difference too. Mm-hmm. I mean I know like going into the fall, the beginning of the winter, especially trout fishing, you know a lot of times it's white or very natural, and sometimes it can be the difference in gray and green. You know if you're looking at redfish and you know it could be tan, it could be olive, they might want something completely black. So changing out your color patterns pretty frequently if you're fishing and not getting hits until you finally get that strike for sure it makes a huge difference for sure yeah especially with flies yeah holy yeah. moly 
there's so many things you start thinking about with flies because you can play with it so much more than you can like a bait. Mm-hmm. Like, do you mm-hmm. want to drag in the bottom? Do you want it suspended? Do you want it to? I don't know. I guess there's enough baits. I feel like the the, the game where I feel like not enough people and my, and even myself, I don't fish hard baits enough in the winter for redfish mm-hmm. because yeah. and, and if they're all the way on the bottom, that's one thing. Like just spooky fish on the bottom, like really only can catch them one gulp and cut bait or live bait. That's one thing, but. If the fish are even somewhat happy, finding that right bait that just spins correctly in front of them, or or sinks slowly in front of them, or mm-hmm. even like a like a floating jerk bait to where you can pop it a few times, it gets down and then slowly kind of wobbles back to the surface. A lot of those approaches for redfish are very untapped. It's something that these fish don't see often. Um, something a way to keep the bait like at their mouth level for a longer period of time. Um, I know I know that y'all fish hard baits for. For redfish some as well. Has, has there been one that seems to work well for y'all in the winter? I like the MR-17. MR-17, yeah. Mm-hmm. If they're, That's a yeah, hard one. If hard they're one pretty high up in the water column. For sure. The Yoziri, the little 3D, is it 3D ass minnow yeah, or whatever? Yeah. Those are pretty color. Yeah, you just got to upgrade that, that hook. The hook's that on them. Yeah. You, I've caught redfish on those stock hooks on those things, but you got to fish like a really light tip rod with very little drag mm-hmm. to be able to get yeah. that done. But. Yeah, but uh, I think kind of going back to Mike's, Mike's point as well, uh, specifically on like the colors. Yeah. I'll give you a good example. So I went fishing with um, Captain Ozzy. Yeah. Uh, and he knew where a school of fish was, and we pulled in on him, fly fishing for him. And um, I had a fly on that was, I don't know, like green and tan. First time in there, got eaten. And we're like, all right, perfect. This is going to be easy. Yeah. Uh, those fish, not really spooky, um, and we were set up really good on them, wouldn't eat that fly again. Really? Just would not, wouldn't even touch it. It got eaten like pretty immediately? The immediately. Time. The first time. And then we're like, alright, we'll switch. Switch to like a tan fly, didn't work. Switch to a white fly, got eaten immediately. And then didn't You're like, get, sweet, this is the color. This is the color. And then didn't get eaten again. Golly, that's um, funny. And at the, at, we didn't want to bully him too much so we left after that but it just goes to show that sometimes that color can work like one time and yeah, then yeah. and then for whatever reason i don't know if they just get spooked from a fish getting caught was it a large group of fish it was probably 40 to 50 40 fish 50. So, yeah so you think that you get get a fly if they're eating aggressively at all you yeah, get a fly that you get two bites. um so for what it's worth uh i would definitely have a, a large variation of colors because they're very, the thing that drives me crazy about that is and in but what also keeps me like addicted to to fly tying and, and fly fishing in general is like God, there has to be some fly that we could have thrown in there where every fish just would have wanted, wanted to it. smash it mud crab fly mud crab <laughs> fly who knows who knows what it is but um you know we only got to try about three different Three or four different flies on them. I'm uh, telling you, I think we need to try to knock out just from some of the uh, even this past year because I haven't tried fishing mud crabs inshore for redfish until I think this past winter. Mm-hmm. And on days where like we were sitting there throwing everything to them and they wouldn't eat it, and you threw a mud crab in there and it everything just rushed on it and smoked it. Um, Find some crab patterns. Yeah, try to tie a really realistic mud crab pattern. Mm-hmm. It would be a hard. Wonder the birds they don't really move that much, that's a problem, but it, I actually just got um for you fly tires out there. Uh I was in Charleston recently and um I was at uh the Orvis fly fishing shop there on King Street. Mm-hmm. And they had like they have a decent amount of materials, not a ton, but they have like perfect little <laughs> crab claws. That you can tie onto your flies. Really? Because, um, like, usually I would use, like, uh, the uh, zonker strips yeah. to, like, make the to make the claws. But these are, like, I mean, they look already just made. like. Yeah, already made. Look just like crab claws. I feel like if, as long as you can just get the crab body, you just tie those onto the back. And you're yeah, good it'd be to perfect. Go. Yeah. That'd be sweet. That would be, uh, I forget him. I feel like I've seen some. Are they, like, a rubber kind of thing? No. They're, um. Like a hard they're kind of, like, velvety. But I mean, it's it's a thin material. And I know what just, you're talking they've about. They've tied it, and then at the end, it just has this perfect little claw at the end that, and it comes in different colors and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. But okay. I, I'm 
I don't throw crab flies no, I don't that either. much. Um, I feel yeah. like I pretty much always throw like quan sliders or uh, like bait fish or crustacean, uh, excluding crabs, more like shrimp stuff, um, which has always worked pretty well. But I'm curious now to see if when they get crabs picky, would crab work would like work really well. well. Yeah, I mean the the crab style flies that I end up throwing if I do are like quan style flies that have like a claw off the back or mm-hmm. something like that instead of a tail it's like a single like a retreating crab or something like mm-hmm. that like the my uh the, what are the what are those flies called strong arm crabs yeah like, kind of like a variation of that mm-hmm. but, what were you saying mike oh uh, no i was just agreeing i was trying to sit here and think like i can't tell you the last time i tied an actual crab fly of any sort not a, uh, well and i think mainly that's because the ones that i tied they just didn't cast very well yeah, mm-hmm. and they kind of just—I don't know—I wasn't happy with them, so I've kind of gone away, you know, and done. Like y'all were talking about Quan shrimp, different uh, bait fish patterns, that kind of thing. So um, that's something I could probably sit down and work on this winter. Some definitely. Um, yeah, that's but, the. Not only do they not usually cast well, but they can be hard to work. Baits to yeah to get to fish yeah. well, to strip well, and to to swim well in the mm-hmm. water. Uh, well, they just take you. It's such a small, like, I feel like a lot of times I get clients that want to strip like six, eight, ten inch strips, you know, big strips per se. And I'm like, no, tick, 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 like two, three inches at most is all you need to move that fly sometimes. For sure. You know, you don't want it to like dart and be gone out of their, peripher- you know, off into their peripheral from one side to the other that fast. You know, right. you want it to be kind of in their face. You want to feed them and let them be able to work up to it. I think that's, you know, we were talking about colors and stuff. I mean, last year, I went out with my uncle February on a school of fish. I know they hadn't really been pressured in two or three weeks as far as I knew. They were happy. They were floating high. Same kind of thing like um, Cameron was saying, you know, we threw tan at them, threw tan at them, threw tan at them. And I'm like, oh, we're not getting the angle right. Finally, after, you know, five good presentations, I'm like, they're not going to eat it. A switch out to something else we switched over to olive every time we got the right presentation they would eat it you know yeah. and then from there it was like after three or four fish they kind of shut down he had an olive with a little bit of purple in it and tried that bam they were back on it and just that slight color change and then getting the presentation exactly right getting it in front of them five six seven feet and letting that school move to it and not even moving it on the lead fish, letting the lead fish get over it and moving it in the middle of the school. You know, I don't know what it was, why the lead fish, you would always spook on it, but once you let it kind of get back and just kind of bring it up, give it a little bit of movement of one, two, you know, one or two little strips is all it needed to get that fish to eat or mm-hmm. get one to commit to it. So. Sure. I had a conversation with someone a while back. I can't remember who it was, but we were talking about, and he had brought up like, how we thought that fish could potentially see colors differently when it's really cold, the water's really cold, or the water's really warm, mm-hmm. based off of Alex Rudd, wasn't it? Maybe it was Alex. Yeah, based like just that their eyeballs really cold or really warm, like it, it changes the um, the, the way spectrum. they see it. Yeah, the spectrum. Have you heard anything about that, Mike? Um, I mean, I don't really. I've never read into it or looked into it, but I could definitely see it. I mean, they're whatever the temperature is of the water that's what their body temperature is that's how their you know changes the way their proteins work in their eyes and everything so i could definitely see that being the case you know yeah i wonder if that's anything to do with it like in the summer color seems like it matters way less it's all presentation Mm -hmm. but in the winter color can definitely play a factor into it so i think too a lot of times like in the winter like at least, you know, that Wrightsville Beach north in the marsh kind of area in that clean salt water, it's so much that they can see that fly from such a distance to or any bait for that matter and study it versus, you know, like during the summer, the water's a little off color, it's a little green, whatever. It's almost more of a reaction t- style eat. Like they see something, it's a shadow, it's a silhouette, whatever, it's in front of them, they see it move, they're going to go up and eat it, you know, it can be, I think, a little bit of that as far as, like, watercolor and just how well they can see the bait. Yeah. Um, Why do y'all think that pressured fish don't eat as well? Like, if a, if a <laughs> school of fish is pressured heavily by, by anglers, why do you think they don't eat as good? Like, what? 
I guess they, I guess that's a dumb question, but thinking about it, it's like, do you think if they're, if they're not spooked at the time and you throw a bait in there, like they're just going to eat it. But do those fish just eat less throughout the winter after they've been pressured that hard? Like, are they not eating even when there's no boats around? Like, what do y'all, what do y'all think about that? I feel like they just get on high alert. Yeah. Like they're yeah. just used to boats pushing them around. Um, and if they're on high alert, they just, they're hard to feed, uh, just cause they're like anxious. Yeah. What we feel like we're not there. They don't feel us, but they really do feel they, us. Yeah, I just feel like they feel unsafe. Yeah. Um, if they've if they've been pushed around a lot, they it takes a while for them to feel safe again. And if if they're feeling unsafe, it's just they, it's just hard to get them to eat. For sure. Yeah, I think that's probably true. Um, I, think a, I think a lot of times, like especially, let's say, a school that's had. I mean, I think about this when I go out and bottom fish. Like, you never go out and bottom fish with cut bait right off the bat if you want to jig fish. You know, once you've presented cut bait, the chances of going back and catching them on the jig are pretty slim. So I think a lot of times, like, heavily pressured schools of fish, you know, they see the first guy comes in, he throws a fly and hard baits or whatever, all artificial stuff, and then all of a sudden now they're having the chance to eat, you know, cut shrimp or blue Mm -hmm. crab or whatever they're like oh that's that's real we know that's real and then oh we got eaten and it's like they want to make sure that like i don't know if they're this smart but they put all the puzzle pieces together like oh that's kind of fake or that's you know not exactly right something's a little off and it's just enough that it kind of makes them weary of it then when you check the next box of scent or whatever then it's you know like oh okay i feel comfortable i want to eat but then once they get, you know, caught a couple of times with that, then they want something even more realistic or whatever to, and they just get weary of anything that's kind of off. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's gotta have something to do or gotta be all of it really. Um, yeah. whoops. <laughs> I feel like a good, uh, analysis of this, um, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, cause I'm by no means am I like a uh, Louisiana professional, but like you go to Louisiana and you could probably throw the ugliest fly in the world in front of a redfish and most likely he's going to eat it. But the reason for that is probably because that fish might not have seen another boat for yeah. what weeks. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and our schools here probably see boats <laughs> close to every day. Yeah, especially in the clear water, they're seeing boats and actually, you know, the crabbers boats are staying I mean, around. Just running them. through, yeah. you know, they they they're getting pushed around quite a bit, probably more than we think. Yeah, you think about their world, and it's it's probably, you know, every couple hours they interact with the human. Mm-hmm. They they start to learn, you know. All right, when the human comes around, we start getting jacked with. I don't know. Maybe we're, yeah. maybe we're, we're making them way smarter than they really are. Yeah, Maybe, but. <laughs> Maybe. they are they are fish after all, um, but I I mean I just I do really believe that uh, the, you know if you pressure fish a lot if you're fishing them every day or if multiple people are fishing them every day there's no doubt in my mind they get a lot harder to catch oh for sure hundred percent I'm not trying to say that I definitely know they get hard <laughs> I'm just wondering why oh. <laughs> Well, I mean, even think about like Louisiana is something me and Judd, the first year we ever went down in college, I mean, we're like, okay, there's a redfish, 60 feet from the boat, worst cast in the world, 12, 15 feet in front of it in a little clear pocket, strip, strip, let him get closer, strip, strip, he's six, seven feet away, just out of nowhere, blazes over to eat it. You know, like we watched him make a huge move for that fly. And here, I just, even if they see something, like, I feel like they're weary of it all the time because of that interaction that they have with boats so often. Yeah. You know, they want it, not necessarily that it has to be that close to them, right on their head, but they're not willing, they don't feel safe in their water to make, like, those big movements. They kind of, they're kind of only feeding in a small area as they work up and feel comfortable through that space. For sure. You know? For sure. I so, think that's or one they thing. even have like small little feeding zones. Like you know, we always have that spot that we go to or whatever where we know those fish feed. I mean, they've got to funnel in and out of all the little creeks around them and move 
but they're only going to the, like those kind of certain areas to feed where you consistently are getting bit. Yeah. So. Yeah, in the winter that definitely happens. Like different different pockets that they'll sit in will be areas mm-hmm. where they feed better than other pockets. You know, I feel like a lot of that yeah. a lot of times has to do with current moving, especially this time of year, because a lot of those baits that they're feeding on are very small little fry that are definitely mm-hmm. victims to the current. So they're putting themselves in those areas mm-hmm. where they can key in on that and um, well, whatnot. But. On that topic, I feel like those winter reds will uh, sometimes are really hard to get to eat if they're in a shallow area. Yeah. And then when they drop into a deep pocket, it's like they'll eat anything. Yeah. 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 No, I agree with that. It's It, it seems like having a little water around them helps them feel. Yeah, I don't know why. And they, I think they feel less, too. They don't feel the boat as much then, probably, when they're yeah. in deeper water. Yeah, probably. As opposed to shallow water, but who knows? Who really knows? you got to get out there and just try to catch them. <laughs> or just throw Ned where you Well, guys, before we wrap this podcast episode up, I do, I forgot to say at the beginning, I just want to let you know about my friend Eric Williams, who is my wife and I's realtor right now. She uh, help, That's helping us find uh, some property to build a house on, hopefully, here in the next year or two. Um, but I'll have all his stuff linked on here if you're looking to buy a house, sell a house, looking for land, property, uh, commercial, anything like that. Just give him a call. Um, he's an awesome dude. Works really, really hard. Loves to fish. Loves to hunt. Um, I know that anyone that listens to this podcast will quickly hit it off with him. So um, check him out and uh, check out Michael. What's your Instagram? Uh, Yellow Fury eighteen. Yellow Fury. <laughs> yellow. Your, the name of your Instagram always cracks me up because if you know that it's like a flat skiff like a yellow fury it makes sense but if you don't think of it as a flat skiff it sounds like like a ninja name (laughs) (laughs) Uh, and then cameron what's yours uh mine's blackbird underscore guide services blackbird underscore guide services Mm -hmm. and mine is judd brock fishing if you got any questions if you want to fish with any one of us hit us up we'd love to get out there in the water with you and we will see y'all next week later oh can't find the end button there it is